I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science engineering. I'm Taylor Sparks, here at the University of Utah's Material Science and Engineering Department, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Andrew Falkowski, and with Jared, our producer and social media guru. It's good to be here. How's everybody's summer going? It's been pretty good, but I'm sad to say that even here in the coronavirus bunker, the cold has got to me. It's not the corona, but I definitely have a cold. Bunker's been breached. Jared, hit the warning button. Uh, we don't have that button. There's no alarm button. <laughs> yeah, not yet. Uh, just a quick update to all those listeners. Hopefully, by the time you look at this episode, you will see that we have some new snazzy artwork and that we've decided to completely revamp our color scheme for that nice dark blue you see on the Instagram and the website. So look forward to that. And I'm just going to brag for a second since we haven't started the episode yet, but I just want our listeners to know that we have breached just about the top 200 in two key podcast listening demographics. The first is the Apple Podcasts Mongolia All Podcasts section. We're at 207. And then in the Apple Podcast New Zealand Technology section, we're at 218. So New Zealand and Mongolian listeners, throw us a bone. Let's break that 200. We need your listens, and we need them now. Uh, other countries would be good, but I think that that is the first key market we need to break into. <laughs> yeah, when I was originally discussing the podcast with Dr. Sparks, I really told him, like, Mongolia is what we really got to target. <laughs> That's the key podcast, material science podcast demographic. Okay, so bear with us today as I'm going to be sniffing into the microphone and an obnoxious amount. We'll try and clean up the audio and editing. But we have what is my favorite episode. I know I always say that, but this time I'm serious. This is my favorite episode because it's what I do my research on. We're going to be talking about materials informatics. Now, you might be wondering what on earth is materials informatics? That's a strange thing, but we're going to tell you. So let's sort of set the stage by saying that um, materials discovery now is just as important as it's ever been. I'd, I'd say even more so. The discoveries of new materials isn't just for fascination's sake. They enable new and necessary technologies. Um, the National Academy of Engineering, for example, they put together something called the, the 14 Grand Challenges in Engineering for the 21st Century. And of those 14 Grand Challenges, it's things that you might expect, like um, providing access to clean water, preventing nuclear proliferation, harvesting energy in inexpensive ways from photovoltaics. I did. I looked at those and I figured out that half of them, eight out of the 14, will require new materials, right? And these are things that we have to do as a species to keep on going. So um, discovering new materials is going to be really, really important. So with that said, Andrew, what was the Materials Genome Initiative all about? The Materials Genome Initiative was started by the U.S. government in 2011. And its whole purpose was essentially a multi-agency initiative designed to create a new era of policy, resources, and infrastructure that would support U.S. institutions in an effort to increase the discovery of new materials, their manufacturing, essentially trying to increase the speed at which we develop new and advanced materials. What's interesting, I remember growing up before, you know, in the 90s, when we hadn't even mapped out the human genome, and, and this whole process of mapping it out was a pretty big milestone, and they realized, like, holy cow, if we could figure out the human genes, we could figure out which ones are responsible for cancer and all these diseases, and so the analogy here with the materials genome is, are there genes, right? Are there specific combinations of materials that could be responsible for the unique and really desirable properties that materials might have? That's the idea behind it. So let me tell you about aluminum 319 to sort of set the stage for this. Aluminum 319 is just another aluminum alloy, but it's a really important one because it is the aluminum alloy that makes possible aircraft skin, right? So aircraft is incredibly, it has to be very lightweight, it has to be crack resistant, it can't grow cracks, right? Um, and the story of the development of aluminum 319 is pretty interesting because if you go back 100 years ago, 
you've got the Wright brothers. And when they were making the engine for their initial airplane, right, they cast this engine, uh, this block for the engine out of 92% aluminum and 8% copper, right? And so by adding that 8% copper, they got improved properties. Nowadays, with aluminum 319, it has something like 10 different elements, right? Um, And they're present at like let's see the thousandth place accuracy so it's not just like 91 percent aluminum and nine percent copper it's to the thousandth place accuracy so four decimal places or four sig figs two decimal places which is amazing and that has the exact you know ideal properties so how on earth do you get to that level of complexity 10 different elements or whatever it is at four sig figs of accuracy that essentially means that there are infinite combinations of other alloys out there that might be even better. And how do we go about exploring them? It, it's a completely intractable problem because that's infinite alloys and we have not, we have a finite amount of time to go after them. Right. Yeah. A lot of science, if you listen to any of the previous episodes, you'll see that a lot of it's this sort of cook and look approach where they'll make something and then they'll look at the properties and that's how they decide that they're going to advance. I mean, oftentimes they make it by accident. A, yeah. a grad student accidentally made something or something tipped into it or they used the wrong substrate and then it had better properties. But that's why, how we got you, tef- uh, geez, Teflon. That's right? how we got Teflon. Yeah. yeah. And many other materials. So, um, there have been some ways to sort of screen for new materials. For example, there are computational approaches like density functional theory, DFT, people might be aware of that. And these allow you to compute properties instead of actually going out and physically making it and measuring it. And that's going to be faster and better, but it's still slow. DFT can take a week. It can take longer. And, and there's some things that it, computer. Right. And there's some things it just can't do, like F electrons, which are really important. It really struggles with um, disordered materials, random structures, which again are really important. It can't handle. And what are F electrons for those unfamiliar? Right. So the F block of electrons, like the lanthanides and the actinides. So lanthanum, uh, samarium, gadolinium, things that are in your magnets, for example like these are very important for phosphors for lighting they're all over the place so this all brings us to today's episode which is on materials informatics um if you're interested i highly suggest you check out my tedx salt lake city talk on this if you just google tedx salt lake city taylor sparks it'll pull up and it goes through this in detail but the idea is that materials informatics allows us to rapidly very rapidly predict properties instead of slowly calculating them now calculations might be more accurate so we know that we're surrendering accuracy a little bit but we're getting way faster speed because we're making predictions so because we can do these many orders of magnitude faster a million times faster we could screen a million more materials right you know many many more times materials what this allows us to do is it it releases us from the burden of relying on luck when we search for materials you don't have to wait for your grad student to accidentally put something in together you can throw together all sorts of crazy concoctions send it through the machine learning algorithm and get a prediction and if it looks interesting you can go after it right you can go and make this so what i think i, I like to think of this as a way of manufacturing uh, rational serendipity for materials discovery or calculated luck we're not relying on just happenstance anymore this might be the tool to effectively go out and look for new materials and it's very adaptable too once you create the model and the algorithm it's very easy to change what direction you're looking in as opposed to if you're going through the experimentalist approach often you have a predefined target in mind if that target suddenly changes it can sometimes invalidate a lot of previous work because you weren't looking at the right target back then oh absolutely so what are the types of things that that uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence does? There's some general categories, right? So first off, you might have heard of supervised versus unsupervised or semi-supervised. All that has to do with is, is your data set labeled? So for example, for a given composition that I have, do I have a label corresponding to, say, a material property, like a strength value or a melting point, right? That would be a labeled data set. On the other hand, if Andrew just gives me a composition and I don't know its melting point, all of a sudden that's unlabeled. So that's the difference between supervised, which is labeled, and unsupervised machine learning where there's no label present. And semi-supervised has a mixture, right? And typically with an unsupervised one, you're trying to look for patterns within data. Yeah, exactly. So for example, you'd want to learn like all the types of materials that uh, are similar compositions like clustering and things like that. Um, so what are the types of things that we expect machine learning to do for us? The first thing we expect it to do is regression. Regression means that you're going to make a prediction on some sort of value, such as strength, given some sort of input like a chemical formula, right? Let's see. When we do predictions using regressions, we do a really good job of them when it's a continuous series, like the strength could be a low value, like 100 megapascals up to you know a gigapascal. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't do very well when you're predicting categories, right? That right. doesn't make sense. So instead, we need to use a different tool. 
That's where classification comes in. So, for instance, if we're trying to tell the difference between, say, an insulator and a conductor, that's where this these types of algorithms succeed in that they're they're very good at drawing distinctions between data within a larger data set. Yeah. Or we just recently recently in my group, we did a paper where we, we published uh, using a classifier to predict crystal structure types. Right. There's. 20 or 30,000 different crystal structure types. And we wanted to take an incoming formula and bucket it into the exact crystal structure type that was out there was, mm-hmm. was what we were trying to do. The main distinction to recognize is in with regression, it's predicting a continuous value. So like a number within a range uh, versus uh, classification, it's going to try to predict a discrete value. Now, another thing that we'd like to be able to do is called image segmentation. What this is, it's the ability to identify regions in an image in an automated fashion, right? So normally, if I were to show you a picture of a, a dog, you, with your human brain, you could say, like, where well, there's the eyes, there's the nose, those are the whiskers. We know how to do that because we've learned. But how do you teach an algorithm to identify those regions? And then how do you do that for material science, right? Could it find grain boundaries? Could it find voids? Could it find a crack? Um, We need a tool called image segmentation, and there are machine learning algorithms that are capable of doing that. Okay? So those are the typical tasks that we want our machine learning uh, to do for us. So how does machine materials informatics work? Well, it typically relies on three key things, data, descriptors, and your algorithm. So let's start with data. Where is data going to come from for material science? This is one of the big problems, actually. Um, The algorithms and descriptors are pretty, you know, we can use off the shelf stuff and they do an okay job, but you can't use them until you have data. Andrew, where on earth do we get data from? Well, material science is a very old field and in some respects, it's still catching up in terms of material, in terms of informatics in general and data science. So a lot of our data for the longest time was stored in journal articles, in PDFs. And so this was formatted into tables that you'd have to manually search through if you wanted to get that data. Yeah, or worse, figures, right? Read it off of the figure. Now, recently, we've seen the advent of a lot of online open source databases, as well as we've seen a lot of proprietary ones as well, where information from literature or from DFT or other modeling calculations are stored and made open, and those are nice and well formatted. But for a a while, and a lot of the experimental data, which ends up being the most valuable, it's still locked in those journal articles. Uh, You know, I'm a section editor for the journal Data in Brief, which is a journal where you don't publish your results and your conclusions. You just publish the experimental data itself. The idea being that even if it's useful for you, it might be also useful for other people, but they need that raw data. And it's hard. It's hard to get people to want to submit that and do it in a way that's machine readable, that others can pull from, that they explain the value of the data itself. But the field is certainly moving towards it. Okay. Um, and it certainly needs to, because if you look at the, the, the number of articles coming out, it's exponential growth. I love to show this plot. I plot it on a log scale for all the types of technologies I do research on batteries, thermoelectrics, photovoltaic, things like that, that I'm interested in. And it's exponential growth. There's something like 10,000 publications on the order of that in every year coming out. And so what are we doing with all that data? Like you can't read that many papers in a year. You probably read a couple hundred if you're lucky. And so that means that we're throwing out huge amounts of data, which was a huge amount of money and time and effort that we're just not learning from. So we've got to do a better job. And certainly having machines help interpret that data and compile into databases is going to be part of that problem. And I think we're doing a really good job in the present right now, trying to shift that paradigm and making things a lot more open and digital and well formatted so that it is accessible. But we still have decades of research that's still locked away in journals. There's a really interesting database, one that was on kind of the forefront of material informatics. It's called the MPDS or Materials Platform for Data Science. Uh, It's also based on the Pauling file, Experimental Inorganic Database. But their whole thing is they get various scientists to commit to manually taking data from these journal articles and adding it to their database. Since its inception, they've gone through 300,000 journal articles and taking the data and put it into this database. I think this is really valuable because there's tons of older data that there's no point in recreating if we already have it. Uh, I guess the challenge is then, how do you find people who are going to invest the time in doing this? Yeah, I mean, you can't even get journals right now to all agree on requiring the data, let alone on a format for that data. Um, So I think that that will change. I think that eventually in our lifetimes, we're going to see journals say, if you submit your article, you have to submit all the data in a specific file. And the reason I think that is because it's already happened in other formats. So, for example, in crystallographic databases, when you publish a, an article where you solve a crystallographic structure, you have to put the data there in the .cif 
file format, mm-hmm. which is machine readable. Uh, it's everything's prescribed in a very specific way. And so in order for us to move beyond the small data regime for material science, we're going to have to adopt formats like the sieve, but for materials files. Uh, back in 2013, my postdoc advisor, Ram, used to say that we need a materials information file, a myth, right? Later on, Citrine actually came up with the PIF, and this is a very versatile format. I mean, if you if you can imagine it, the type of measurement for materials, they have a way of cataloging it, cataloging it in a machine-readable way. So whether that's images, an optical, you know, a physical photograph, or whether it's microstructure or tabular data, temperature-dependent, it can all fit within the PIF. So I think we solved the problem of having a format for publishing data. Now it's a matter of adoption. We need to get people to start adopting it. Mm -hmm. And once we do, I think we're going to start to see the rise of large materials property databases. Citrine is one, and there's others, like the Materials Data Facility and NIST hosts some data. But we're going to see more. And this is what's happened in the crystallographic space. There are now lots of crystallographic databases, the ICSD, the CCDC, ICDD, PCD. There's tons of these things. Um, There's public ones as well as private monetized ones, but it's all based off the fact that you have this singular um, accepted format for uh, submitting crystallographic data. And I think you really have to start them young. Here's my idea. In, In my experience, when I'm going through a class and I'm having to manage whatever data I take there, I just use the laziest possible format because all assignments in a lot of my college classes that require me to manage my data are finite and they're very short to the point where if I have too much, it'll never get to the point where I have too much data and it becomes unmanageable. It'd honestly be good to start recruiting undergrads and just putting them in this uncomfortable situation where they have to use these PIF files uh, and actually take good care of their data. I like that. We do that in my um, programming class. We give them a problem that technically they could do it by hand, but it would take hours and hours, or they could just write the script to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's data. We know that we need data, and there's at least a path forward for better data in materials informatics. Let's move to descriptors. So what exactly are descriptors? Sometimes we call these features, you know, but it's the same thing. So I think the easiest way to describe these is remember that oftentimes machine learning is trying to make a prediction. So let's assume I'm trying to predict the height of people in this room. Uh, this is the example I always use that if I'm trying, if I'm trying to predict your height, well, what could you tell me about yourself that would help me predict that? Could you tell me your age or your weight, your shoe size, your belt size? The, the, the idea is that if you give me enough of these descriptors or features, I'll probably be able to build a model that gets better and better and better, right? These are things that are correlated with the target property. So when it comes to materials properties, what are the descriptors that we need to use? So there's a couple of different out there. First off, there's, again, private and public ones. So public is things like... Um, Jarvis or the Olianic descriptor set. And what these are is it basically says for every element, it lists all sorts of elemental properties, the melting point, the number of electrons, the group, the column in the periodic table, you name it, hundreds of different columns of information, the color of it, right? Who knows? We, we basically throw everything in those because who knows what will be correlated with the property that you're trying to predict. And it might be some nonlinear combinations of these features, right? It might be the, the number of electrons squared or divided by, you know, the atomic radius or who knows, right? The idea is that you want to learn those relationships with your algorithm, right? But you have to to have those descriptors to start with. Um, and so there's lots of different ones. There's Matt Miner, Jarvis, the Olianic, there's CGCNN and Schnett. I mean, there's no shortage of different descriptors out there to choose from. And you can always choose your own, but it yeah. is easier to just have a predefined one. Yeah. And a lot of groups actually do build their own. They build their machine learning model with like five or six descriptors, right? Um, and they're things that uh, a scientist would assume would be important ahead of time, right? If a model tells you that the ionic radii should scale with the property that you're interested in, they just put ionic radii in, right? And they don't necessarily add number of electrons if that doesn't matter. And the number of descriptors you have will increase computational costs. Right. And it, if you have too many descriptors, it also can lead to overfitting, which is essentially that your algorithm memorizes your data. But then when you give it something new outside of the data set that it memorized, it does a bad job. So you typically want to do something called regularization, which is when you reduce the number of descriptors. So you can, you want to reduce, uh, it's sometimes called dimensionality reduction. You basically, you force your algorithm to look at your descriptors in a different way where you reduce the number of them. Okay. So there's things like principal component analysis and other tools for doing that. Uh, you can also do nothing, right? And we'll talk about that a little bit later. You can actually give it no descriptors and have it learn via deep learning. So we'll give you an example of that a little bit later. All right, tell us about algorithms, Andrew. So there's actually quite a 
quite a lot that you can use. And usually you want to tailor the algorithm that you're using to how difficult or the type of problem that you're dealing with. There's no point in like the buzzword right now is a neural network, but you don't need to throw a neural network at everything. Some problems are simple enough that we don't need to go through the amount of data you need to actually make a neural network work and the computational cost of running one. Yeah, a neural network may not even be the best fit because it is yeah. so data intensive. And if you are like most materials problems in the limit where we might have under a thousand data points, that's probably not a good problem for deep learning to approach where you typically need over five or six thousand before it you know, becomes on par with the accuracy of other models. Right. So the so, other models you can use are like what? Well, I think the one that everyone's pretty familiar with is linear regression. In yeah. school, I'm sure you've been, you've been given a scatter plot. You've been asked to fit a line that tries to show uh, a pattern or a trend within those, those data points. And that's the simplest linear model that we can think of. And it's quite useful in many cases in machine learning. But when it comes to things that may not scale linearly or more complicated processes, we have to think about more complicated algorithms. So the next one that's also very popular and very powerful is called the random forest. Yeah, random forest is, is what's called an ensembling technique. It's an ensemble because you take an ensemble, you take many different instances of the trees, right? You build many trees, uh, and these are decision trees where you ask a question about your data. You say, okay, is the ionic radii larger than or less than some number? And then you split your data up. And then you ask another question. You say, is the melting point above or below this certain temperature? And then you keep on. So it can be think you can, be, you can think of it like a tree upside down, right? There's like the branch and then there's the, there's the trunk and then there's the branches and it splits out to the leaves. So that forms a tree and a forest is made up of many trees. The idea being that you randomly or intentionally choose how you select your data. You're going to split it up in lots of ways. You're going to split your descriptors up in lots of different ways. And you're going to build many, many of these trees and try and figure out what's the most um, effective descriptor for splitting your data. Or in other words, which one of your descriptors are the most useful for making your prediction? Right. And the reason you want to use an ensemble in this case, although they're, they're very useful in many others, is that decision trees are often very prone to overfitting. And so by creating lots of random perturbations, I think is the right word, Yeah, uh, you're generalizing your model a little bit more. Yeah. So random forests are actually a really good model. They do have some weaknesses. They tend to do really bad at the extremes, right? So they can predict the, the median values quite well, but the extreme scenarios, they do really bad. And they are mathematically incapable of going beyond, of extrapolating beyond any values that you've seen before. So if the largest, let's say, strength value in your data set was 500 megapascals, it's physically incapable, like it's mathematically incapable of predicting something above that. So that's a problem for some things. If, if what you really care about is extrapolation, which uh, we're going to talk about as being pretty important. Um, there's another type of algorithm called support vector regression or support vector machines. And in the, this was sort of the buzzword before the deep learning neural networks, which are the buzzword right now in the 90s. These were pretty hot. Um, these are harder to describe. They essentially draw lines between your data. They want to they want to separate different clusters of your data or regions of your data in an effective way. The one of the strengths of these is that they rely on a kernel. A kernel allows you to split your data up in different ways. For example, you can do a radial kernel. You can do nonlinear versus linear kernels. So it allows you to um, capture non-obvious effects in your data in a ways that say like a linear regression simply wouldn't be able to do because you can go into nonlinear kernels. And to kind of explain what a kernel is doing, let's just say that thermal conductivity is one of our descriptors. If we have a polynomial kernel, what this will do is it will generate additional descriptors. So instead of just the thermal conductivity, you'll also have the thermal conductivity squared or cubed That's right. going upward. And so the reason we do this is that a lot of properties or a lot of predictions might not be entirely linear. And so by adding a polynomial effect to it, we can now get non-linear non -linear predictions. And this can also help in areas where we have a lot of sparse data, where we might not see the vectors that are formed from these descriptors um, intersecting enough. Honestly, a lot of these algorithms are not best explained over audio, so we're just giving you a brief overview today, but um, that's the main idea. Next up, we've got the deep learning, right? This is hot right now. So if you've heard of neural networks, you've probably seen the diagrams, a bunch of different points all connected together with, right? So these are your nodes and they're connected together. Um, well, taking it a step back, essentially they're based on the idea of trying to simulate how neurons in the brain work. <laughs> In a neural network, if you've seen an image of it, we'll put some artwork of it on our yeah. Instagram page. So you'll see these interconnected nodes that are trying to mimic how uh, neurons in the brain work. 
between each of those nodes is a linear function that's applied to whatever the input value is. However, when it gets to the next neuron, we then apply a nonlinear function. You'll see with a tanh or a ReLU function, which applies nonlinearity to it. That's what makes these neural networks so powerful is that now we have nonlinearity built directly into the algorithm. And so we can find patterns and make predictions on things that are extremely complicated. And if you look at the diagrams of these, depending on how many nodes and how many layers there are, there can be millions and millions of parameters, right? There are so many parameters that you can choose from that eventually there, if you give it enough data, it can memorize your data set, right? Really effectively, um, which makes these really powerful. Now, within the neural network world, there's lots of other really cool things you can do. Like there are convolutional neural networks where, you know, is an episode for another day probably, but you can actually take and you can convolve over your image, which is basically you take a little filter and you slide it over pixel by pixel through your image and that allows you to capture different regions of your image like edges that's for example if you want to figure out like our eye our eyes naturally know our brain knows how to look for eyes versus a snout versus a paw we we have that filter in our brain you can have convolutional neural networks learn those filters for whatever your image is so in the world of material science you could have it look for dislocations right you could have it look for high versus low angle grain boundaries it could learn those with different filters um, there's also something called GANs, which are generative adversarial networks. These are really cool. Essentially, it's two neural networks pitted against one another. You have one neural network, which takes two pieces of information. One, it has a real image. It's been trained off of many real images. And then the other image coming in is an unknown one. And it tries to figure out which is the real one and which is the fake one. Or it tries to figure out if the one coming in based off what, what it's been trained on, it tries to guess, is this a fake one or a real one? So think of it like a detective. It tries to figure out, is this a forgery or the real thing? Meanwhile, you've got the counterfeit artist, right? The forger. And they try and take random noise. They send it through a neural network to spit out something that looks like the real thing. So it also has been trained on real images before. Uh, you've probably seen this with faces, right? It, you give a this GAN a bunch of of images of real faces and then you give it white noise and the generator generates an image that looks like a real face but it's it's totally new and then the discriminator tries to figure out whether that one's real or not and these two feed back on one another and get better and better and better until all of a sudden you've got GANs that can generate images that look real they look absolutely real yeah and you get the benefit of training two models two for the price of one grandma yeah it, what's cool about these in material science, my, my group right now, I've got a student working on these where he's giving it real crystal structures, right, from these different databases that are out there. So these are real crystals. And then we are trying to actually now use the generator to generate new crystal structures, which have never been made before. They're not in the database. And yet they look like real ones because it's not enough just to screen through millions and millions of potential materials. We want to screen through millions and millions of materials that look like they could be real ones, meaning they might be thermodynamically stable. They might be easy to synthesize. So you can do some really cool thing with GANs. Okay. Andrew, tell us about Bayesian models. I believe that a discussion of what Bayesian statistics is all about is a little outside of the scope of this episode. However, there's been a rise in... Mm -hmm. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> still I'm hard. trying to think. When we're, hard. when we're thinking about trying to discover new materials, Dr. Sparks mentioned that there's some uncertainty, right? We are sacrificing accuracy to get faster predictions, but that uncertainty matters. And so... What Bayesian statistics really excels at is capturing that uncertainty in a quantitative manner. They do this by, instead of representing variables in a function as discrete values, rather as probability distributions. And so the idea behind Bayesian approaches to machine learning is to essentially try to make more in-depth probabilistic models that better capture uncertainty. So the end goal being, okay, say we predict 400 samples or 400 new potential materials. Now we have uncertainties about those predictions, so we can then filter some yeah. of those candidates by that. One of the cool things about Bayesian versus the frequentist approaches, which we've been describing previously, is it kind of fits well with material science where we don't have a lot of data, but we do have models and we know how things ought to behave. So we have a good prior, right? We have a prior um, assumption about how things ought to behave. And because we have limited amounts of data, we're, we know we're going to be adding more data. And each new data point that we get, our model can be updated. We can say like, okay, we think strength increases with ion, you know, ionic bond uh, strength. 
And then we, if that isn't the case, then the model can update in real time and learn what's going on in that material system. So it's well suited for active sequential learning, which is honestly kind of where material science is at because we are limited in our data. Um, and then there's one other type of machine learning which has not been heavily used in material science called reinforcement. I'm not going to say a lot about it. If you're familiar with um, AlphaGo, this was the, the AI that beat the Go human masters, um, or AlphaStar that beat the uh, best uh, battle... Um, StarCraft players, um, these are reinforcement learning. How they work is you give an algorithm many, many scenarios, and then you penalize it for getting things wrong, right? So you give it a some sort of reinforcement, right? When it, uh, in, in the case of like the games, you could assign values to the to the pieces lost or, or gained, right? And so you're giving it a feedback loop in real time, and then you do, you let it play many, many times, and it can it just tries to maximize its score essentially. And there's little application of this in material science, but I think you're going to see more soon. Right. And it's important to know that as algorithms get more complicated, sometimes you also, they also require a lot more data and more well-processed data as well. So there's trade-offs to using them. Okay, now that we've gone through all of the different algorithms, done a brief introduction to material informatics, we're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, we're going to talk about some really interesting applications in material science, some great case studies that really show this working and being very effective, talk about some critiques of material informatics, and then give you a quick rundown on how you can get started in the field. If you've been listening to the Materialism Podcast, you've probably heard us talk about MatMatch before. It's a great service that helps connect suppliers and consumers of different materials. Let's just say, for instance, I'm interested in experimenting with rubber. I noticed that some rubbers, when you get into the summer, they get a little bit too hot and they don't they aren't as effective. And so I'm interested in thinking about different additives I could add to rubber. If I go to the MatMatch website and I look under applications, um, under industries, they have a rubber and plastic industry that I can look into. Under that, they have raw materials you can look at, as well as auxiliary materials and additives. Under here, I see 11 different items uh, that I can buy that I can add to rubbers to uh, manipulate their properties. This is just one example of how you can find what you need for your engineering project on MatMatch. By the way, in this episode, we're talking all about data in material science. This is a great repository that lists the properties, the chemical composition, the impurities of all of these different materials that are available for synthesis. The materials that we use matter, especially when we're trying to use machine learning algorithms to predict off of them. So this is a great resource. So next time you're working on an engineering project and you need some materials, go to matmatch.com. The Materialism Podcast is also sponsored by Materials Today. Visit materialstoday.com or elsevier.com to find out more about their journals, books, conferences, and related programs. Already we're back from the break, and now we're going to run through some of the applications of material informatics. Then we're going to walk you through some real case studies and then discuss some of the critiques of the field. So there's lots that you can do with material informatics, anything from generating phase diagrams, building out the composition space, and helping us better understand what materials are possible. There's also predicting crystal structures for compounds and the likelihood of defects and vacancies. This is really important for their properties. It's also great that you can use convolutional neural networks to help connect observed microstructure with the final properties of a material. So that can help you say, okay, we made this, we have an image under an SEM, what are the properties likely to be? Um, at the same time, you can also generate your own microstructural images that can help with training or help better understand them. There's also the idea of maximizing conflicting objectives. So let's just say that you're trying to make a ceramic that's both have had, that has both a low thermal conductivity, but also high strength. These are often competing in terms of how the physics works out. And so with machine learning, it's really helpful that you can actually you know, generate algorithms that maximize the two, find a material that has a maximum of both these properties that might be conflicting that you're looking for it can help with the selection process. And then the thing that Dr. Sparks specializes in is materials discovery. 
So yeah, let me just sort of talk about this a little bit. I was not trained in computer programming. I took like one class in my whole life in computer programming. Everything has been sort of self-learned. And what got me into this field is in 2012, I was doing my postdoc and we were writing a really good review paper because we had just made some, we thought that we'd follow the rules. Um, in the field of thermoelectrics, you don't want your materials to be too electric, electrically electrically conductive or they'll have a poor Zabit coefficient, but they can't be too resistive or they won't work either. So you typically want to find things like on the bubble there. And we were looking at a family of materials that are on that bubble that are in between conductors and insulators. And yet we got really awful properties. And so to try and like figure out why our materials were so bad, we decided to zoom out and publish a review paper where we saw, we, we wanted to look at where our materials lied versus where others in the field lied. And what we did is we gathered tons of data from lots of papers. Next thing you know, we'd pulled up data from a hundred different compounds and we were all we were just plotting them in different ways in this paper. And it turned into a really interesting review article. We built a website that goes along with it. Um, in fact, you can find it if you go to tiny.cc slash data mine, you can see our visualization tool. So we were pretty excited about this. We published what I thought at the time was a really good review article because we cataloged all this data and we even went to the effort to build a website and visualize it in a really cool way. So we published this and then a company reached out to us and this company had just barely been formed. It was Citrine Informatics. They reached out to us and they basically said, Hey, will you give us this data? And we said, well, we just published it. Like it's out there in the review article they said no but give us the actual raw data if you do that we'll teach you how to do machine learning at the time i didn't know what that was or what it was good for but we figured we'd give it a shot seven years later this is one of the most important things that i do in my research group it's it's fully one half of my research group is dedicated to machine learning uh, for materials research and the other half actually still does experiments and is experimental. So let me give an example of how this works in my research. Um, a few years ago, we got a grant from the National Science Foundation to work on super hard materials and super hard materials. Mankind's been after them since the beginning for literally thousands and thousands of years. We've been after harder materials. Um, and finding a new material that is super hard is not trivial. Um, so a super hard material is something with a hardness over 40 gigapascals, right? So diamond, we you learned last, lep last episode, is a very hard material, has uh, hardnesses in excess of 80 or 90 gigapascals. And then there's a few other super hard materials, but most of these things all require extremely high temperatures and pressures, or they're made of materials which are non-starters like rhenium, right? And so what we'd love is a material that's not crazy expensive, and doesn't require crazy pressures to synthesize. So what we decided to do is we learned from DFT data. We pulled from about 5,000 DFT data where individuals had predicted bulk modulus and shear modulus. We like those because if you know the bulk and the shear modulus, those correlate with hardness. Hardness is not always reported and it depends on how you measure it. It's this whole mess. But bulk and shear modulus, DFT people do calculate that. So once we had pulled from that, we could then train from that 5,000 data points and build a model that will predict for any chemistry that we give it what the bulk and shear modulus are. So once we had these predicted bulk and shear modulus values for over 100,000 compounds, all of a sudden we could then say, all right, the materials with the highest bulk and shear modulus, the materials that are both stiff and rigid, those should be the hard materials. When we investigated those, sure enough, we found two new materials that were just at the threshold of the super hard. They had about 40 gigapascals at low loads and you can make them without high pressure. You could just arc melt them and they were made of relatively low cost materials, which is really excited. So that was a cool case study to show how we went from basically knowing nothing about this field to uh, seven months later, the first six months was just gathering data, honestly. The algorithm uh, was very, very fast. And then the actually making these things took about a week to make them. And it was funny, we went to publish it. And, you know, even though we had these really high hardness values, it was interesting. When we went to publish this, the people said, yeah, but show us that your predicted bulk and shear modulus values were correct. It's like, who cares? Like, the hardness is correct. So who cares about the bulk and shear? But we said, fine. So to do that, you have to do this whole synchrotron experiment. It was this... It's a lot harder. It took seven more months. In fact, it was funny. It took more time to validate that those two values were correct than it was to discover two of the hardest materials ever discovered, which is pretty exciting. So that's really the power of this algorithm approach. We would have never known to search for those two materials. They, there's too many to pick from. And yet the algorithm was able to point us in the right direction in a really short period of time. So imagine this in every field, in batteries, in high-strength steels, in lightweight alloys for vehicles. If you could 
reduce that development time by orders of magnitude using machine learning, that's pretty exciting. Um, another case study I want to talk about is in image segmentation, because I think this is really cool. There's a group, Elizabeth Holm out of Carnegie Mellon University, and she can train her graduate students to, sh to look at a fracture surface. And normally grad students can look at a fracture surface. And if it's really smooth, that's indicative of a brittle fracture, like glass. If you ever dropped a plate, it's nice and smooth. Whereas metal, which is more uh, ductile, when it breaks, it's sort of more uh, has like pockets, right? And so it's rough. Well, they look at these images and they try and guess whether it came from a brittle versus a ductile fracture. And they had some accuracy. Now, what's really cool is that you could give those images to a machine learning algorithm and they would use image segmentation and they would be able to make a prediction and they would outperform humans, which is pretty amazing because there's so much domain knowledge and the human eye, we think we're so good at this, but these algorithms are outperforming humans, which I thought was just a really cool case study of the potential for machine learning and not just making predictions, but in this case, categorize, uh, making a classification based off of images. Machine learning, especially in material science, is a really popular subject right now, but it's important to keep our expectations in check, right? This isn't something that's going to replace the scientist, and it shouldn't, right? Machine intelligence versus human intelligence really aren't commensurable, right? They're completely different in terms of what they're good at. But what's really nice about machine learning is that it allows us to leverage what computers are good at and let humans work on what they're good at. Yeah, what I like about it is imagine... Imagine machine learning algorithms as like a 70 year old, brilliant, experienced scientist who's in the lab, right? They've seen a lot of things. They've made a lot of compounds. They have a pretty good, what we would call chemical intuition for, oh, that compound's going to work for this and this one won't, right? But it's at the end of the day, still a suggestion. And you can use whatever human knowledge you have on top of that to say like, oh, okay, they're suggesting this, but that's rhenium. So I'm not going to bother with that, right? So they go hand in, in hand, you're right. They can act as, in a lot of ways, really great suggestions, but you should still use your human knowledge on top of that. And there's some things that they're bad at, right? Something that we just published on recently is in extrapolation. Machine learning does a great job with the existing tools of finding averages, right? The existing tools are things like Netflix uses to predict shows, right? If it sees that Andrew's watched all seven seasons of Battlestar Galactica, it's like, hey, you're probably going to like Firefly. But maybe Andrew actually wants to watch My Little Pony, right? That's not a typical show to watch after Battlestar Galactica, but it might be what he wants. It's the exception to the rule. And oftentimes in material science, what we're looking for is not the average. We're looking for the exceptions to the rule, the extreme scenarios. Andrew's so mad right now that I accused him of being a brony. So mad. I don't even think that justifies <laughs> a response. But... That, that is a good point. Like a lot of the things that I see and a lot of the critiques is right. You're looking for exceptional materials or you're looking for outliers. Much of these great materials that we discover are outliers. But when we train these machine learning algorithms, we're not training on outliers. Yeah. And oftentimes we don't, a lot of the databases, right? These databases are filled with materials that work. Rarely do we ever plug in materials that don't work. And so yeah, how do we... what gets published? We're taking from literature and it's hard to publish a paper when your experiment led to bad results because no one's interested in reading that paper. But a machine learning algorithm needs that. It needs to know good and bad outcomes as long as it's carefully done data in both cases. Mm -hmm. Right. It's about defining those constraints so it doesn't get out of control, right? You want it to look in the outliers, the, the out of bounds, but you don't want it to go so far that it just comes up with something crazy. So what we did recently in our paper when we were looking at extrapolation is that we treated it like a classification problem. So we took our data and basically it was like a, a, a bell curve of values for whatever the value was. Bell, I think it was bulk modulus. Most of them are lame. And 1% of them are really interesting because they're really high bulk modulus, really stiff materials, incompressible materials, I should say. And so what we did is we labeled them. We said, all right, the 99% lowest values, we're just going to call those ordinary. And the top 1%, we're going to call them extraordinary. So instead of trying to predict the values and figure out which ones were highest, we treated it like a classification problem. Oh, we tried really to cool. classify them as ordinary versus extraordinary. And we showed that when you do that... Um, using simple algorithms outperformed the the big heavy ones, right? A simple logistic regression outperformed, I think, almost everything in that scenario, which is cool because I think the, the traditional thought is like, oh, use the heaviest algorithm you can do. Do deep learning if you can. If not, do a really heavy SVM or something. And what we showed is that really simple approaches and treating as a classification instead of trying to predict the actual value was more effective, had a better F1 score, which is a, a validation metric that shows that it was more effective. 
Right. I think that's kind of the difference between machine learning at Facebook, for instance, versus material science. <laughs> material science. We have such little data and we have such unique and constrained data that and our tasks are different. Uh, yeah, and we, we the have to, task we're trying to do is different. We're not looking for averages. Yeah. We're looking for extremes. Oftentimes, we have to be smart about how we approach it. Like you're saying, thinking about traditional problems and then coming up with interesting or unique ways of approaching them. Right? Someone working at Facebook or one of these big data companies can get billions of data points every single day. If they want to brute force through a neural network. Uh, to try to find some sort of average or predict something, they have the data to do it. They have the resources to do it. But that's not always the case in material science. And so there's so much more to explore. And really, it's about working smarter, not necessarily harder. And there's lots of great examples about this. Um, Chris Wolverton at Northwestern University, he's one of the top groups from my understanding in material informatics. Um, they were doing a models to try to predict some properties of perovskites, right? And so they did one model where they trained it solely on experimental data. So they only took data from the literature and stuff that they had made. They took another one where they did a mixture. So they'd had some experimental data, but then they threw in a bunch of stuff they generated, but from the DFT, like we were talking about stuff that would be impossible and wouldn't work, but also stuff that sort of broadened its field and added more context. And it turned out that that model ended up doing a lot better. Yeah, we just published a paper on that very similar thing called ensemble, ensemble learning. So essentially we had models that were trained off of DFT data models that were trained off of experimental data. And then by ensembling these together, we got even better performance, which is really cool because in material science, where we have these small data sets, we're going to need ways to learn from many small data sets because we don't have one great, awesome repository right now. Citrination, right? Citrine's depository is a great start, but it's not there yet. It's not, it doesn't have everything we want yet. And so in the meantime, we're probably still going to be learning from many small repositories and ensemble learning um, could be a really cool way to overcome that. Um, there's other critiques of machine learning, materials and informatics. For one thing, a lot of the databases that are out there are DFT data. And we've already talked about the problems with the DFT data. Um, it's zero Kelvin. There's no disordered structures. It struggles with F electrons. Um, and a lot of these compounds don't actually exist. They are simulated. So somebody calculated its properties, but that doesn't mean that that compound is thermodynamically even on what's called the convex hole, meaning it's it actually exists in nature. And so you're training off of a bunch of compounds that may not even be real. So that's a problem that to consider yeah. when you're when you're training from that data. I did some research last summer. It hasn't been published yet, so I can't talk about it um, too much, but it really is that that challenge of okay, how do we how do we understand how do we predict materials at higher temperatures, right? If all we have are these DFT datas, and we're trying to we're interested in materials that can withstand high temperatures, we want to be able to predict how the materials are going to behave at those higher temperatures. But if it's all at zero Kelvin, that's kind of tricky, right? And so I think. In addition to material informatics, I think there's this computational material science side where we leverage thermodynamic models and other physical models in addition to our machine learning to make it even more powerful. Yeah. Another really common uh, criticism I hear about this is interpretability. A lot of scientists, we love cause and effect. Hey, material science is based on this. It's all about understanding structure, property, processing relationships. So when you take it, you put a black box between some sort of chemical formula and outcomes of property, and we don't know how it makes the prediction. It just does. That really rubs scientists the wrong way. They don't like that. Um, I know from experience because I talk to a lot of them and they don't like it. Um, so I think that there's certainly value. If it, if it is truly a black box, totally uninterpretable, there's still value if it makes predictions, but not for all things. It doesn't help as much with discovery as it does for screening and finding useful applications. But what a lot of material scientists want is to discover, right? We want to know the chemical origins, the mechanistic reasons why the properties are the way they are. And machine learning struggles with that. Um, that said, there are some cool new things happening right now. We just published a paper on a new algorithm architecture. Um, it's called Crabnet. If you go to Chem Archive and Google Crabnet there, you'll, it'll pull up. We'll put it in the show notes. What's cool about this is that it uses what's called an attention-based learning approach, right? These are called transformers. So in the natural language processing field, these have revolutionized things. Natural language processing, that's when basically uh, Google Translate does. When you put an English language in sentence and it spits it into German or Chinese or whatever, it does what's called natural language processing. And the tool a few years ago that revolutionized everything f was invented by Google and it's called a transformer. And these hadn't been applied to material science yet. And it was, you know, to our knowledge, we're one of the first couple groups that actually published in this field. And what's really exciting about them is that they can generate attention maps. So what these are is a way to give interpretability to your machine learning model. They show you what parts of your descriptor set are valuable for what types of predictions in a visual way. Like, so all of a sudden you can say like, oh, that descriptor 
is responsible for this. And that makes sense because mechanistically that should matter for, you know, it allows you to, to apply that sort of structure property processing relationship uh, mentality that material scientists have to a, a machine learning model, which is I think going to be exciting for interpretability. Every time I log onto Reddit, I go to r slash materials and I see a post without fail <laughs> almost once a week about I'm interested in material informatics. How can I get started? And then there's only like two replies because we've had like a hundred of these, these posts, but say no more. I'm not going to see any more of these posts because you're going to listen to the next couple minutes while I talk to you about some really great resources that you can use to get started. If you're completely new to machine learning and you know maybe a little bit of programming or if you don't know any, the book I'm going to recommend for you to read is called Introduction to Machine Learning with Python by Andreas C. Muller and Sarah Guido. It's a fantastic book that goes does very simple explanations of all of the different algorithms, and it has code online that you can access and it walks you through it. It's really great and explains everything. It's how I got started. Now, the next thing is once you get started doing material informatics, you know, that book is great, but it doesn't tell you everything, especially because material informatics is so specialized. There's it's not number the same as machine learning. It's pretty niche. Right. There's a number of pitfalls that you might fall into, but fortunately, Dr. Spark's group has put together a great article. It's titled Machine Learning for Material Scientists, an Intro Introductory Guide Towards Best Practices uh, by Wang 2020. It's on Chem Archive. It's actually just got published in Chemistry of Materials. But oh, if you great. want... The, if you don't have access to the article, you can find it on Chem Archive. It's we barely changed it at all. We think that this is the um, seminal, you know, best practices paper for this field. So we, um, what's great about it is that for all the sections, there are also GitHub tutorials for how to make the figures, for how to split your data, for how to apply different descriptor sets. It's all there on the GitHub. So we think that this will make your life a lot easier because you won't be doing the coding from scratch. You can use good examples that are pre-built. If you want to learn even more about uh, material informatics citrine that company we talked about has a dedicated podcast to material informatics it's called data lab it's pretty good and they interview a lot of professionals in academia and in industry who talk about how they're using material informatics in their work and finally you're going to need some data so there's a couple of great databases out there that we recommend that's they're free and open source and they're easy to pull from those are the materials project uh, citrination or aflow or okmd OQMD is really good unless you try to do it through Python. <laughs> They're still on Python too, and it's a nightmare. Um, so we hope you've enjoyed this episode. We have so much more to say about materials informatics. If you've got specific questions or if you want to give us some feedback on this episode, we'd love to hear it. In fact, you can send us emails anytime at materialism.podcast at gmail.com. We check that email maybe once a week. So if it takes us a minute to get back to it, don't worry about it. If you want a faster response, ping us on Instagram. We are at materialism.podcast. We get that right away. We try and provide some cool content there. We're posting funny images. We're posting the things that we're doing. You can get sneak peeks on the episodes coming up. And it's a cool way to interact with us. You can say a suggestion for a new episode or whatever you want. Also check out a new format we're going to try out, which is Materialism Basics. These are going to be really short, very fundamental versions of the podcast where you don't have to listen to the full 45 minute episode on polymers to learn about the a specific review of overview of polymers. We're going to put that in a really bite-sized chunk just to get you caught up and put those separately. <clears throat> you may have noticed last month that there was an extra episode on top of your normal episode. This is a new format that we're trying out and will continue in addition to our normal materialism episodes called Micromaterialism. You guys send us so many suggestions and questions on episodes that you want, but we don't always have the time to cover those or we may not think that there's enough content to cover all that. So this is our chance to cover your suggestions in a way that's very concise and just a short little 10 minute bite so keep an eye out for those episodes they'll be coming out in the middle of every month as always we would super duper appreciate it if you would leave us a rating on podcast or youtube you know whatever the podcast channel you want or youtube um, that helps people find us right that will help us clinch that top 200 spot in the mongolia all podcast section of apple podcast don't let us down help us out every review helps a lot we appreciate it and we want to throw out uh you know throw a bone to the people that make the music for the show alphabet and colobite as always Always, we think they make cool music, and we think that you should check them out. Um, they're on Spotify and Bandcamp, um, colobite.bandcamp.com, and Alphabots on Spotify. Okay, as always, thanks for listening, and we will see you next time. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton, the makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician. 
are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials.